here for Zalagamoto, the show dedicated to reviewing every English language game release for the 8 and 16-bit Sega home consoles. Last week I started off with a segment dedicated to recent additions to the collection, but with the last week being Thanksgiving and Christmas quickly coming on the horizon, new games are probably going to be placed on the back burner to concentrate on the gift-giving season instead. And I simply don't have anything new to show, so let's go ahead and get into it with actually one of the games that was shown in last week's New Arrivals. And that game is... Trivial Pursuit for the Sega CD. Now I mentioned last week that before I saw this game at the Let's Go Retro Game Expo, that I didn't know it existed. Now of course I've got a list of games I'm targeting for this channel, which is how I know it's in the 1250 range, but I don't have that list memorized. And while well, maybe I saw this game in a store 25 years ago, Let's face it, I can barely remember things that happened last week. My comment was more intended to mean that this is simply isn't one of the more common Sega CD games. Or at least that's my experience. Now, just because it's not common doesn't mean it's valuable, mind you. And Actually, before I clean up the case a bit, it had a disc replay sticker on it for $1.99, which could give you some idea about how not in demand this title is. Or at least was, as it currently goes for about $15 to $20 complete. What is Trivial Pursuit? I'm glad you asked. And if you didn't ask, just pretend you did. Work with me here. Come on. Trivial Pursuit originally was a board game first released in 1981 that became popular in the mid-80s. I remember my parents having the original version, also known as the Genus Edition, not Genius, and it being pulled out and played at certainly family get-togethers, like Thanksgiving, actually. However, being a trivia game, eventually the questions included in the game would be asked so many times that the players would memorize a large percentage of the answers so the makers of Trivial Pursuit began to release updated editions and card packs that had different questions or had themed sets like say television, movies, Disney, Star Wars, etc. Gameplay in Trivial Pursuit is pretty simple. Six is the key number of the game. The game is designed from two to six players. There are six categories of questions on the board and your goal is to collect six pie pieces which is done by landing on one of six spaces on the points representing one of the six categories on a six-sided star-shaped board. See what I mean? Once you've collected all six pie pieces, you then attempt to move your marker back to the center of the board to answer a, hopefully, final question picked by your opponents. Get it right and you win, but get it wrong and the game continues until you can land on that central spot to try it again. So, like I said, relatively simple. And the simpler a board game, the easier a job a developer should have at translating said board game to a video game, right? Less rules to interpret and represent, minimum board pieces to animate, and a game board that has a basic geometric layout. Well, as we've already seen with Risk way back in Episode 3, even a simple board game requires some effort to produce a digital version worth playing. And just to make things interesting, I'd like to point out that the full title of the game is Trivial Pursuit Interactive Multimedia Game. Oh boy. So did Parker Brothers do a solid job of creating a multimedia version of one of the most popular trivia games of all time? Or is Trivial Pursuit just another shitty licensed cash grab and there's a good reason why I didn't realize this game existed before two weeks ago? Well, let's take a look. Here we have Trivial Pursuit and as this game was released in 1994, it was well into the Sega CD run. So we have the large size jewel case to deal with. And uh, thankfully, this uh, case is in relatively good shape. It's pretty common for these cases to develop cracks somewhere along the line or have broken hinges due to the amount of surface area involved. But this case only has a small crack on the top of the rear, just up there. And the hinges are fully intact. Uh, there's a few scratches here and there, uh, but I've seen much worse, and it's hardly worth mentioning. As far as the front cover goes, I actually think this looks pretty decent. In the past on other games, like Dragon's Lair and Racing Aces, I've complained that the logo ends up being too small, uh, due to the amount of surface area lost from the spine and the Sega CD label over here, so it has to scrunch everything over to the right. Um, but in this case, the Trivial Pursuit logo and the title is sized properly, taking up about the top third of the front, uh, leaving the rest to showcase pictures that are included in the game down here, uh, showing off the multimedia aspect of the title. Granted, the in-game versions of these pictures look nothing like what's represented on the cover, 
due to the limitations of the Sega CD, and you'll see what I mean when we flip over to the back. Uh, one th small thing that really caught my eye uh, when I picked this up was the VRC rating at the bottom down here of MA13. Uh, now, I have no idea why Sega chose to drop an MA13 on this game. Uh, it's certainly not intended for kids, as the average kid in 1994 probably wouldn't know the answers to many of these questions. Uh, and there's certainly nothing objectionable in the game, at least nothing I've found. All I can guess is that there may be a damn or a hell in one of the supposedly 2,000 questions included in the game, but I've got a feeling this is one of those games that, if it had been re-rated by the ESRB a year or two later, it probably would have gotten a lower rating. Uh, over the back and Oh, this, uh, this layout gives me a headache just looking at it. Uh, first, let's focus on the screenshots. Uh, there's seven, all relatively small, um, with a shot of the game board up top, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that because you'll see plenty of that later on. Uh, and then also, um, down below, there's two layouts on the left and right that try to uh, depict the uh, whole question and answer process with some you know, text over here de describing what's in the screenshots. Um, now, I get what they were trying to do here. But the text in these pictures is so small, like here and here, uh, a casual observer is just going to think that they duplicated the screenshot. Um, I think it would have been made a whole lot more sense to have uh, fewer larger screenshots, just showing different aspects of the game. Um, because anyone that picks this up is already going to be pretty familiar with how Trivial Pursuit works. Uh, opening the game up... You'll see that this came with the original protective foam, which is really nice. Uh, you don't see that a whole lot. Uh, and then the manual, if I can get it out. Uh, the manual is in uh, good shape, except for a little tear at the bottom back here. Uh, and opening it up, uh, there's not a whole lot here. It's a pretty short manual uh, but it does explain how to play the game so I can't really complain too much uh, although weirdly it has the same screenshots from the back of the case see right here but they're inverted um, see how the, the white is black and, and that sort of thing um, and they did the same thing with yeah here the Mount Rushmore picks you can see that those are inverted as well. Um, I don't know if that was an error or done on purpose to try to get them to show better in black and white. Uh, who knows? Uh, one last small thing. Uh, the warranty reply card is intact here on the uh, back of the manual, which was common for the Sega CD titles. But if you notice, Parker Brothers was so cheap that they didn't spring for the postage and required players to put a stamp on the card for delivery back. I, I'm willing to bet that exactly none of these were mailed in because of that. Uh, just an odd thing that I don't think I've ever seen before. Uh, well, now that we've dis thoroughly dissected this package, uh, let's get to the actual game. As I mentioned earlier, the subtitle to Trivial Pursuit on the Sega CD is Interactive Multimedia Game. And as you might expect, multimedia is a large focus of the game. From the dawn of the CD-ROM era, multimedia was a huge buzzword when it came to games and applications. Seeing digital pictures and, gasp, videos on your computer was the new frontier to be explored and exploited. In the days before Wikipedia, CD-ROM-based encyclopedias became quite popular, as the ability to condense large sets of books down to a single disc was extremely useful and being able to use your home computer to do research and potentially be entertained by pictures, audio, and video clips definitely made researching a boring term paper much more fun. However, there's a big difference between PCs and Macintoshes of the early 90s that people used for their multimedia experiences versus the Sega CD. The first problem in viewing video clips or pictures on the Sega CD versus a computer is the vast difference in resolution between a computer monitor and a standard definition television. The lowest resolution the Windows PC used for this sort of thing would be running at 640 by 480 
and more likely than not, a higher resolution like 800x600 or 1024x768 would probably be being used. The Sega CD running at 320x224 just simply wasn't designed for displaying higher resolution pictures or video, and as a result, they end up looking like a pixelated mess. Along these same lines, the Sega CD unfortunately had the same 64 color limit that the base Genesis had, compounding the poor visuals of even black and white pictures. The end result is a game with pictures and video that might have been passable in 1994 due to being a novel concept, but by modern standards it's extremely difficult to look at and enjoy. Beyond just not being pretty, the trivia questions are given with said pictures or video sequences as part of the actual questions, and being able to determine what slash whom the pictures are depicting can be the difference between getting a question correct or not. Most questions didn't seem to be too affected by this, but there were definitely a few where I was struggling to see what was intended. Okay, so we've established that the interactive multimedia selling point of the game is mediocre at best, but what about the actual game itself? Well, included here are two versions of Trivial Pursuit, classic and fast. Classic is what you would expect a digital version of Trivial Pursuit to be. You can have up to six players via a single controller, and each player can choose their name and what color game piece they want to have. Once that is done, players take turns rolling the dice and moving their game piece around the board in an attempt to collect all the pie pieces and win the game. However, one thing I should point out is that unlike the previously reviewed Jeopardy in episode 34, Trivial Pursuit doesn't have any actual method of answering the questions. Instead, players hit a button to reveal the answer, and then must hit another button to signal whether you got the question correct or not. I'm not really sure how I feel about this, it seems a bit lazy to me, and does leave open the possibility of mistakenly saying a question was answered correctly that wasn't, and vice versa. But I've also played trivia enough times that sometimes getting a trivia question correctly is a judgment call, and I can see where it would make more sense to just have that be on the honor system. While the classic game mode is functionally standard Trivial Pursuit, there's one thing I have to mention, and that's the amount of time it takes to play a game. Anyone who's ever played the board version of Trivial Pursuit knows that even a two-player game can take some time to complete due to the requirements of landing on certain spaces on the board and getting questions correct, and just multiply that amount of time when you add more players to the mix. So you're already dealing with a potentially lengthy game, but then keep in mind the single speed CD-ROM drive that's at the heart of the Sega CD, and that for every question there's load times involved to either display a picture, play an audio clip, or a short video. The load times slow the game down tremendously and require a decent amount of patience. As I mentioned before, in 1984 I could see where players could ignore the load times due to the novelty of the game, but in 2019? No way. Also offered is the fast game mode. Fast mode is slightly faster than regular mode, and it is more similar to the portable Trivial Pursuit game, where you pick a category at random, and then, if you get it right, are awarded a game piece for that color without having to go back and forth on the game board. It's slightly frustrating because you have little to no control over what category you have to answer a question for versus having options in the classic game, but overall the game does move quicker and is a nice option to have if you're limited on time. One thing you've probably noticed as you've been watching the gameplay thus far is how ugly the game is. Now, I'm not referring to the multimedia aspects of the game that I've already discussed ad nauseum. I'm referring to the game in general, specifically how the screen layout looks, and the game board. Jack Nicholson. I like how the screen layout is designed to resemble one of the cards from the board game, but beyond that, the low amount of colors available for the game really hurt the presentation. When looking at the game board, like we saw with Risk previously, this doesn't look like a 16-bit game. It looks like an 8-bit game and certainly not a multimedia experience. It's just a game that's hard to look at all the way around, and worse when you consider the amount of time that you have to spend looking at the game to complete a round. Also, you might not be able to tell from the video, but certain colors like yellow and green, or orange and brown, are somewhat close, and if your television isn't calibrated just right, you may have a problem determining which spot on the board is which. And there's nothing worse than rolling dice and answering questions over and over just to land on a pie piece location only to figure out, oh, I've already got that one. Being that the game is a Sega CD release, and with the emphasis on the multimedia aspect, you think that the game has good sound. And, well, it's passable. 
The in-game background music is okay when it plays between questions, but it's nothing special and certainly nothing memorable. And it certainly doesn't make you think, man, that's some high quality CD audio instead of the normal Genesis music. Certain questions feature speech reading the questions out loud, and that's a nice touch, but I don't understand why all the questions don't have that. You'd think that'd be a no-brainer, but no, more often than not, you're left to read the questions to yourself. Overall, I'm giving Trivial Pursuit Interactive Multimedia Game 2 stars out of 5. I thought very hard about giving it only 1 star, like with Risk. Ultimately, I decided it earned that second star, though, because it's functionally Trivial Pursuit, so it at least accomplishes a set goal of being a Trivial Pursuit game, and for when it was released, it was technically a step above what was available on cartridge-based media. However, would I spend time playing it in 2019? Certainly not. And it's definitely not worth going through any great strides to get a copy of, unless you're collecting everything for the Sega CD and can find it cheaply. And that was Trivial Pursuit for the Sega CD, a game that probably deserves to be banished to the abyss of time. It's a curiosity of the era, nothing more, and if you're after dated trivia questions, you're much better off heading to your local half-price books and picking up a used edition of the board game from the 80s. I mean, unless you like grainy pictures and excessive load times, in which case, by all means, pick this one up. Tune in next week for one of the last reviews of the season where I take a look at another game I picked up at the Let's Go Retro Expo a few weeks ago, which ended up spawning three sequels on the Genesis and a Master System version, but not in the United States. Remember, whatever you play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later.